Why don't we pray together? Lord, it is an immense privilege to be with your people. We thank you for bringing the Hantless back. We thank you for uh, sustaining David, sustaining all of the family in uh, their pursuit of good medical care. We thank you that you have uh, preserved him. We pray that you would use him mightily for your glory and for the sake of the gospel. God, we pray that you would bring many onlookers, especially in the medical community, um, to faith in Jesus Christ. God, we pray that you would continue to do what only you can do and sustain with otherworldly peace and power uh, those who are suffering. God, we lift up our own hearts to you this morning as we look at your word. We pray that you would do with your word and with surgical precision what is necessary uh, inside of us. We ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't really like being awakened from sleep. Maybe you do. Maybe it's just me, but alarm clocks are an intrusion. The sound of water gushing from a burst pipe is an intrusion. Or maybe that frantic question in the middle of the night, Honey, did you hear that? What was it? These things intrude into comfortable slumber, sweet dreams, cozy blankets, and a soft bed. All of a sudden, this urgent summons to decisive action. Our passage of Scripture this morning does exactly that. It confronts us with an intrusion. It is the intrusion of light into darkness. It is the intrusion of coming judgment into present comforts. It is the intrusion of future reward into present lethargy. Now, this morning's text brings an intrusion of eternity for us into time. It is the intrusion of Jesus into our comfortable earthly existence. And the facts are Jesus is and Jesus is coming and we will all stand before him. And we will all stand before him very soon. For the Christian, these facts reignite our urgency and our fervency. For the non-Christian, my prayer is that these facts would arrest your attention. Perhaps even free you today from slavery to an endless train of vain pursuits that only leave you empty and wanting. Now, we need this morning an eternal perspective that this passage presents in order to fulfill the ethical obligation that this passage demands. We're going to get an internal perspective that is going to help us live as we should. Let's read together Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 14. Here's God's word through the Apostle Paul. This, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep, for now, salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is almost gone, the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. The Apostle Paul in this passage will make two appeals to us for urgent living. He's going to tell us, know the time and live accordingly. Know the time and live accordingly. Let's look first at this first appeal. Know what time it is. Know the time. And Paul begins this section in verse 11 by simply saying, and this. The New American Standard Bible adds the word do. Do this. But I think this is just a, an attention-getting conjunction, a, a connecting device that connects us to everything that has gone before, beginning in chapter 12, verse 1. Do you remember that great hinge in Paul's letter to the Romans where he has extolled for us the mercies of God for 11 chapters and then says, therefore, and begins to explain the Christian life? What does life look like under the reign of grace? How must Christians live? And these instructions will continue through to the end of the letter. 
And from chapter 12, verse 1, we were looking back on the mercies of God. But here in Romans 13, 11 to 14, we are looking forward to our meeting God. There is a looking back that fuels the Christian life, and there is a looking forward that here will incentivize Christian living. And Paul garners our attention, sums up what has gone before, says this, knowing the time. By time here, he is speaking of a period of time characterized by some special crisis. He is speaking about the here and now, the present time in which Christians now live. And he's going to tell us here that that time is running out. Do you know what time it is, Christian? Eternity is on the way. And and if you've ever contemplated the duration of eternity, you've engaged in some mental gymnastics that cause you eventually to give up. There's no comparison. A couple of times in Scripture, we're encouraged to go ahead and try to compare earthly suffering to eternal joys. And such comparisons cannot be made. In 2007, Jeremy Harper, he was a computer programmer, set out to count out loud to a million. He worked for three months, 89 days, 16 hours a day, without breaks, and counted to a million out loud. A million's a lot. That is the record for the highest any single person has ever counted. If you've ever thought about big numbers, we can perhaps get our mind around a million. A million seconds is 11 and a half days. There are approximately a million letters that a large size book can hold. But it would take 32 years to count to a billion. If you take the, the number million and, and describe it by multiplications of 10, you have 1 times 10 to the 6th power. That is, a million is a 1 with 6 zeros. A billion is 1 times 10 to the ninth power. That's a 1 with 9 zeros. A trillion is 1 times 10 to the 12th power. That's 12 zeros after a 1. A trillion seconds is 32,000 years. And every printed book in history, if you could put them all together, would contain approximately a trillion letters. Now, 1 times 10 to the 100th, that's just a little bit bigger than a trillion, is called a Google. Now, the search engine spelled it wrong, and we've gone with their spelling ever since. But you can look it up. Google is spelled differently. It's a lot. It's a one with 100 zeros. And a Google is more than the number of atoms in the known universe. It's a big number. Now, if you took 1 times 10 to the Google power, or 1 with a Google zeros, you get a number called a Googleplex. A Googleplex is a big number. To simply print out the number Googleplex, that is a 1 with a Google zeros after it. In order to do that, if we, in order to put that in a book, it would be a multi-volume set. If each volume had a million zeros, then the number of books it, requi- it would require to contain a Googleplex written out one zero 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 is the weight of those books would be more than the entire Milky Way galaxy. And Googleplex is still a finite number. If Googleplex is a number of years, you still have not begun to touch the duration of eternity. Christian, do you know what time it is? Eternity is coming. Your life began at conception, and whatever your earthly age, you have only barely begun to exist. And the infinite duration of eternity still lies ahead of you. This really puts all of us in this room. Me and us other young people and some others of you who are older. We're all like just right there. We've only just started, all of us. And you must reckon not just with the duration of eternity, but also its significance. It's 
weightiness. The weightiness of eternity is critical for us to understand because it's not about simply an accumulated number of events on a timeline or activities on your schedule. Eternity has to do with a person, a person. Time is running out for this world and for everyone on it. And what makes that fact so significant is that what awaits each one of us is an encounter with our maker. You will meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And how you have related to him in this life has infinite consequence for the remainder of your existence. Christian, do you know what time it is? And Paul tells us what time it is here in this passage. In fact, he gives us a trio of pictures of urgency, and they're all parallel with one another. First of all, he says in verse 11, it is time to get up. It is time to get up. Notice what he says. Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. And to awaken from sleep here is not a call to salvation. This is a wake-up call for Christians. This will become more clear in the second half of verse 11. The sleep Paul is referring to here is the drowsiness of meandering through life, being squozen into the mold of this world, thinking everything is hunky-dory, finding our identity in what this world is doing, going along with the world's direction and the world's pace. Some have called it moral drowsiness or thoughtless indolence. Martin Luther said, Christians who are sluggish in good works and overcome by the feeling of security are falling asleep. That is the sleep Paul talks about here. It is time for the Christian to stop hitting the snooze button. You know the snooze button. In fact, you're so familiar with the snooze button, you can hit it from a dazed stupor and turn off that intrusive alarm. And Paul here says it's already way past time for you to live with eternity in view. And the second in this trio answer to the question, what time is it, is salvation is near. Paul says, notice the second half of verse 11, for now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. And here he's talking about final salvation, not initial salvation, not the day you were saved by Jesus Christ through new birth, forgiven of your sins, given a new identity, made a new creature, eternity secured for you. No, this is Paul referring to our final salvation when we are with him and sin is done, sin is eradicated. It is our rescue from what Paul calls in Galatians 1.4, the present evil age. That is the salvation that we long for, look forward to. And to look forward to a future salvation is not to say that what, accomp what God accomplished for us in new birth is somehow uh, at, at, uh, up for question. Everyone who got saved will be saved. But there is an anticipation here of what is to come. And notice this future salvation, Paul says, is nearer than when we first believed. He's speaking of Christians. He's speaking of salvation in the future. Peter says similarly that we who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That is, Christians are those who have faith. They have been saved, but they are looking forward to that future salvation. And to say that that future salvation is nearer today than it was when you first believed is, of course, an obvious statement. I mean, Paul, why did you even need to say this? I think I needed Paul to say this. It's an obvious truth. But you know that time at summer camp when I was really excited about eternal things, when, when eternity rushed into my life and intruded my comfortable, meandering life merrily, merrily down the stream existence. All of a sudden, I'm thinking about eternity, and I was so excited to share the gospel with my friends, and I hated sin afresh, and I love Christ more, and I just couldn't wait to be with him. Remember that? I need to hear that again. I, I, I'm not as excited today as I was then. What has happened? Where have my affections gone? If the day is nearer today than it was on the last night of that summer camp experience, then I should be more in anticipation, more ready, 
more longing for that day. And so this very obvious statement is so obviously necessary. Do we live like the day is nearer? Think about a bomb with one of those little timers, and it's counting down. The numbers are getting smaller, and you know what happens when the numbers run out. And you might be thinking, well, just defuse the bomb. Uh, give me some cutters. I'll just cut the wire. Uh, give me a little more time. Well, listen, you're not Jason Bourne. You're not Ethan Hunt, and you're not Jack Bauer. You don't get extra time. You don't get to defuse the bomb and, and delay the return of Christ. You don't get to delay your own homegoing, Christian. So what would you do if you could see the timer counting down? How would you live? I'll just sleep. I'll, I'll party for a while. I'll get drunk. I'll get immoral. I'll be selfish. This passage says, Christian, wake up. The clock is ticking. Eternity is coming. This is no time to sleep. Do you understand the math of eternity? Do you understand the physics of eternity, the duration and the significance of it? And it's coming. And it's closer now than it was yesterday. It's closer now than when you first believed. Whether it is the day of the Lord or whether it is your own death. Christian, thankfully, this is not a bomb about to go off for your destruction. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Or should you be alive and remain when the Lord returns, you will be with him. And it's a matter of great joy. But Peter reminds us, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled. So that on that day, your anticipation will bubble over into what Isaiah the prophet described in Isaiah 25, 9. This is our God for whom we have waited. Is he your delight? Is there anticipation? Jesus himself said at the end of the Bible, behold, I am coming quickly. Look, you might feel like, I've been a Christian for a long time, and there have been Christians for a couple thousand years, and there are people who have waited on God for a long time. That doesn't seem quickly to me. When it happens, it will seem quickly. It's coming soon. If you knew that you would die this week, if you knew that Christ would return this week, what would your life be like? How would you order it? What would you do? And think, for Paul, for Augustine, for Luther, for Tyndale countless others, that day has already come. Death has taken them home, and they're with Christ. And everything that could have been done on earth in time is over. No more storing up treasures. No more bringing God glory in your earthly existence. Time's up. Time's already expired. <laughs> And Christian, your time is coming soon. There's a third description in this description in the trio of time here, beginning of verse 12. The night is almost gone and the day is near. That is, dawn is approaching. And there is a contrast built up between night and day, between dark and light throughout this passage. It's a familiar concept in the Old Testament imagery and all over the New Testament. The night here is this present evil age, as Paul calls it in Galatians 1. The day here is uh, perhaps a, a specific reference to the return of Christ and the day of the Lord. It is that day when the righteous daytime will replace the nighttime of this present evil age. There is a day coming when the Lord, the Lord Jesus, will have his day. He will have his vindication where he himself is vindicated and seen to be right. And his people will be vindicated. Enemies will be subdued. Knees will bow and tongues will confess that he truly is Lord to the glory of the Father. And what has seemed to us a long, cold, dark night will give way to the breaking of dawn and to radiant light and goodness and peace and beauty. God's shalom will envelop the earth. The world around us is darkness. 
And the world around us behaves as if the darkness is normal, as if the darkness will perpetually remain. But notice verse 12. The night is almost gone. The day has drawn near. We are right on the verge of this light breaking in. We ought to be like the kid on Christmas morning who wakes up before the sun comes up in eager anticipation. Could it be today? The Christian dawn is approaching for you, either by the return of Christ for you or by your going to him through physical death. And the Christian is in this world but does not belong to this world. This, the Christian has been transferred out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. We've been transferred from slavery under the dominion of sin into the dominion of grace. And similarly to those metaphors, Christians are children of light. Christians belong to the light. Christians belong to the day. Listen to 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul writes, But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there again is a very similar message to what we see here in Romans 13. The day is coming... God's children belong to the day, and in eager anticipation of that day, they live in a dark world, living out the principles and the conduct and the priorities of that kingdom of light. Christians walk in a world of darkness, but we are not of the darkness. We are of the light, and we are to live as in the light because we belong to the light. And this should cause us to think less of this world and more of the one that we are to inhabit. The breaking of the dawn is the moment that you've been longing for, the moment you've been waiting for. The first appeal Paul makes for us here is this instruction for urgent living, know the time. Christian, do you know the time? The knowledge of that truth will lead us to a certain ethic, a certain behavior. That's the second point in your outline. Know the time and live accordingly. Live accordingly. And that's what Paul takes us through beginning in the second half of verse 12. He says, therefore, that hinge that is going to give us the, the inference, how we are to live out the truth he's just put before us. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. We have the truth and a therefore. And after the therefore here is a trio of contrasts instructing our conduct on earth as Christians. Three contrasts. And the first contrast is simply this. Discard dark deeds and dress for battle. Discard dark deeds and dress for battle. Paul says, therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Um, let us is neither a salad vegetable nor a asking for permission. Let us is a way to say a command for all y'all plus me. All of us do. Okay, that, that's what Paul is saying here. And, and what command is he giving Christians? First of all, discard dark deeds. Lay aside the deeds of darkness. Literally, re remove them like old dirty clothes. Take them off and set them aside. Put them off. And these are deeds which characterize the night. These are deeds which describe and characterize the darkness of this world. Do you remember the scene in John 8 when God was here in the flesh? Jesus in John 8 is very likely at the festival of lights after the sun has gone down in the temple complex in Jerusalem. And the scene would have been lit up by these great big pyres, these great big fires lighting up the perimeter of the temple, giving light to the temple in the midst of darkness for the festival of lights. And Jesus stands in the crowd, this 
little guy from Nazareth in front of all these lights in this great big temple complex, and he says, I am what? The light of the world. And it's really remarkable. Everywhere Jesus, the Son of God, went in his earthly ministry, it is like the light of heaven just poured down on him and through him and shone everywhere. The light of truth, the light of righteousness, the light of life. It was spoken on his lips. It was demonstrated by his power over creation, his power over sin, his power over demons. And Jesus, the light of the world, walked in our dark world for a time. And then he went away. What did that dark world do with Christ? John 3.19 says, light came into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light. Why did men love darkness rather than light? Because their deeds are evil. Do you understand what goes with darkness? A rejection of God. Evil behavior. The kinds of things you have to do in the dark to keep secret. Look, day walking is... You know where you're going. You see clearly and you are clearly seen. It is confident and sure-footed. But night walking is surreptitious. Stumbling around in the darkness. I, I, I don't really want to see clearly and I don't want to be seen. And I've got to do these activities. I've got to think these thoughts where, where it's not fully exposed because these activities are inherently shameful. I don't want people to fully see them. If light were to come into this set of activities, if you had the opposite of a solar eclipse, if all of a sudden the sun just shone at 2 o'clock in the morning on all the deeds of darkness going on in the city, people would scurry for more cover, darkness. Why? They love the darkness because their deeds are evil. And what did the darkness do when the light of the world came into it? They extinguished the light. When the light of truth, when the light of righteousness, when the light of love shines in a dark place, the darkness crushes the bulb. Now, this is a fundamental commitment to darkness that rejects God, hates light, hates Clarity hates exposure. Smash the light, shut it off. I love darkness. That's the world we're in. And so the command of Christians is this contrast. Lay aside those deeds and discard them. And discard them for what? Exchange these dirty old clothes, the deeds of darkness, for light armor. Not insignificant armor, but the armor characterized by light, brilliance, bright, truth, goodness. Put on the armor of light, Paul says. Clothe yourself in armor characterized by the light of heaven whose children you are. Armor described by light and righteousness, it is the light of Christ. And the word for armor here described soldiers. The hoplites were the Roman soldiers that were decked out in armor and weapons. Uh, the, the singular word hopla came to mean weapons. That is the instruments of warfare. We already saw this word significantly in Romans 6. Do not offer your bodies as weapons of unrighteousness. It's the same word here. Put on the weapons, the armor of light. There's something significant we have to understand from this metaphor. The Christian life is a battle. It's not a nap. The Christian life is a battle. And you must be dressed in military readiness for a battle. Christian, you have enemies. First of all, you have you. Residual depravity in the heart. There is the residue of sin. That which is forgiven by Christ, but that which is not fully eradicated that plagues you from the inside. It is an insidious, 
insider enemy, deeply embedded on home turf. In addition to what's inside you, you've got the world outside, the world system governed by Satan, resisting God's rule that seeks to squeeze you into its mold. And then you have the prince of the power of the air, the god of this world, Satan himself, who roams like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Christian, you have enemies. Don't go to sleep. Get up and gear up. This is a battle. This is an urgent command for military readiness. You might be thinking, wait, isn't the Christian life a rest? I mean, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and you will find rest for your souls. Yes. So do I rest on the battlefield? Yes and no. The rest in Jesus is a rest from the empty, vain pursuit of the hamster wheel of legalism. That is, human merit, rule-keeping, trying to make your way to God by pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. It is the hamster wheel of thinking you're better than somebody else because you kept more rules or better rules than the next guy. And it is all hypocrisy and whitewashed tombs and a sham and damnable. And every human religion chases that same path and runs that same hamster wheel with a bunch of different labels and never gets to God. You come to Jesus, you have to turn from that, leave all of that behind, and come to him, and you will find rest for your souls. And if you know Jesus, you know that rest. And it is so sweet. And then you find out, yeah, I'm resting in Jesus. And I gotta put on my armor because there's a battle. And these things are not opposed to each other. There is a rest from legalism in Jesus, but not a rest from activity. The Christian life is a life of urgent, vigorous fighting. And we see here in this contrast the put-off, put-on pattern that we see oftentimes in the New Testament. Put this off and put this on in its replacement. And sometimes in the New Testament, that is a positional reality, and sometimes it is a continual reality. It is true, and we've already seen this in Romans, that the old man is gone. He has been put off. The new man has come and has been put on. Uh, But here there is this reality of put off the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light, spoken to Christians, and an urgent command that is to be the readiness taking place in all of the Christian life. There's a second contrast. Discard dark deeds and dress for battle. The second in the trio of contrasts here is behave properly, not wastefully. Look what Paul says in verse 13. Let us, again, there's that command for all of us, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, etc. Let us behave properly. Uh, The original just says, let us walk becomingly. Now, walking here is a metaphor for the Christian life. It's a helpful metaphor. Again, the Christian life is not a nap, but it is walking. It is a continual walking. This is a regular metaphor in the Apostle Paul. It is uh, speaking about the continual conduct of the way you live your life. It is a walk. And Paul says, walk as in the day. And we just went through the metaphor that said the the day has drawn near, the day is dawning. You're at the last bits of the darkness of night and the day is dawning, but we already belong to the day and so we live now as of the day and as in the day and we certainly live in the day of the light of the truth of God as he's revealed himself in his word. We anticipate being with him in person, in his presence, but we live with all of heaven's priorities as our governing of our conduct. And we are to walk as in the day. We are to walk properly or becomingly, appropriately, in a matter fitting with your new identity. You are of the day, so walk as belonging to the day, dressed in light, walking in the light, eagerly waiting for the light to dawn on the whole world and erase the darkness around us. That is our disposition as Christians. 
not squeezed into the mold, resisting the darkness. And the contrast in verse 13 is to that manner of life that is unbecoming. The conduct unbecoming in verse 13, Paul gives us three pairs of vices or, or three pairs of categories of wasteful living. Wasteful living. The, those kinds of activities, those patterns of life which dissipate your existence. Where you've lost sight of eternity heading towards your life like a freight train and you've been, been squozen, squeezed, squeezened, whatever that word is supposed to be, into the mold of this world, have become conformed to it Living for now as the world does. Listen, Christians face these temptations. Paul is telling Christians here, in your manner of walking, in your pattern of life, here are some categories to put off. Don't walk unbecomingly. Now, these are all in the plural, by the way. That means they are headings. They are broad descriptions of types of sins. This list is not an exhaustive vice list. As if, okay, if I just stay away from these things, I can close my Bible and I'm good. The reality is that these are headings. They describe types of behaviors. And they come in pairs. The first pair is carousing and drunkenness. Carousing is partying, revelry. It is a feasting to excess. It is the word used in the festal procession for the god Dionysus. Dionysus was the god of wine and fertility. He was the god of insanity and ritual madness and ecstasy and frenzy. The religious worship of Dionysus involved alcohol. It involved inebriating substances that worked you up into a religious frenzy, an emotional ecstatic experience that made you feel like you were somehow close to the divine. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. It was an awful deception. He is also known as Bacchus, part of a Bacchanalian feast. He had another name, Liber, where we get our word freedom or even liberty. People felt like they were freed up by this just bring way more food than anybody needs, way more drink than anybody should have, and let's just go for it. <laughs> Let's eat and let's drink for tomorrow we die. It's just a Bacchanalian feast of pleasure now, get it all. Carousing or partying. New Orleans Mardi Gras and Rio's Carnival are patterned after this very feast for Dionysus. It's no surprise that drunkenness accompanies this revelry. Paired with carousing, the drunkenness depicted here is a revelry in pursuit of drunken stupor. There's a reason this deception is so attractive in a world of darkness. I just need to bury my conscience, forget that little freight train coming my way called eternity, and try to enjoy something. Paul says, don't walk in it. The next pair is sexual promiscuity and sensuality. That is sexual immorality, sexuality in excess, sexuality outside the bounds of God's design. Sensuality is a lack of self-constraint that involves self-abandonment, conduct that violates all bounds of what is acceptable. This is immorality and sexual deviancy. And this pair is a summary of a whole litany of sexual vices, many of which were common in Corinth uh, in the very day that Paul wrote this letter to Paul, uh, to, that Paul wrote this letter to the Romans. And in our own day, there are taboos and vices that were culturally acceptable not long ago, have now become acceptable, even normalized, and what, is, what now is taboo is exposing those things as darkness. It's now culturally unacceptable to call these deviancies sin. Just by way of example, in recent polling, a majority of professing evangelical believers said that they believed that premarital sexual activity was not a sin. It's staggering. The church, again, is being squeezed into the mold. The last pair here is strife and jealousy. 
Maybe, maybe just kind of wanting what somebody else has, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. Maybe that seems out of place with a drunken orgy. But this is exactly where God puts it in this list. We might use Jerry Bridges' label here for these as respectable sins. Jealousy and envy. I mean, desire what someone else has. Politicians build their whole careers on promising to give you what other people have. What's wrong with keeping up with the Joneses? And strife is just a reflection of, you know, standing up for yourself. Um, getting and protecting what is yours. Looking out for number one. Fight the power. Join the resistance. Troll the internet. Say your peace. Join the march. Do a riot. These things are not seen as vices. They're seen as virtues in our culture today. Strife and jealousy seem to have not just become acceptable peccadilloes, but recommendable activities. They are, in fact, deeds of darkness that need to be put off like old dirty clothes and replaced by proper behavior befitting the children of light. Christian, wake up. The time is far gone for us to be hitting the snooze button. We are to walk in the light as children of the light. There's a final contrast here in verse 14. I might put it this way. Put on Christ and defund the flesh. Put on Christ and defund the flesh. Look what he says. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Here's that put off pattern again. Put on. Here it is put on Christ. Be clothed in Christ. To be wrapped in him. Again, this is not a command for salvation here, but an urgent mandate for daily walk and warfare. It is to know Christ, to think like Christ, to be like Christ. Obedience to Christ is putting on Christ. And being clothed in Christ is an apt metaphor. Our clothing is what people often first notice about us when they see us. Are you intentionally, daily, hourly putting on the Lord Jesus Christ? His lordship is highlighted here. His personal relationship to us as Jesus, the man from Nazareth, is highlighted here. And his title as Christ, Messiah, God in the flesh. You get the whole name here. The Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on. And while this is not a call to salvation necessarily, we do know that God used this text to bring Augustine to himself. Living a profligate life, prayed for by his mother for three decades living for himself, walking by a child who is singing a little sing-song ditty. Take up the book and read, take up and read. You know, it's like the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that. it's like that. He's walking by, he hears it, and he opens a Bible to this verse, and then he's a Christian. And so while God used this text to draw Augustine to himself, this text itself is not a call to salvation, but it is a revealer of salvation. To claim that you belong to Christ without a pattern of being clothed in Christ, is a deception. Now, God's not deceived. He sees all the way through pretenders. It is a self-deception. Robert Haldane said this, whoever does not put him on in this manner shall find themselves deceived in the other. If the pattern of your life is not regularly putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and making no provision for the flesh, then you have a fundamental question to ask about whether you ever put on the Lord Jesus Christ in a saving way. And the other half of the contrast, last part of verse 14, and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Make no provision. In 1519, Hernan Cortez invaded Mexico. He had an army and a navy. The army was in the boats. I guess that makes him a navy. And they began to conquer the peoples of the Yucatan Peninsula. And he experienced a mutiny. Some people wanted to go back. And uh, he didn't want any further mutinies. So he destroyed the boats. Um, popularly believed he burned them. Burned the ships, point of no return, kind of comes from that event. Um, he actually just sunk them. He scuttled his own ships, scuttled his own navy. Why? So that potential mutineers couldn't get back on the boats and abandon what they were there to do. Whether or not you agree with what Cortez was doing is another story. Christian, in regard to the flesh and its lusts, scuttle the ships. Scuttle the ships. Sink the navy. If there is a provision 
a, a storehouse for the flesh and its desires in your life. Just get rid of it. Why keep it? Making provision for yourself is like going on an Antarctic expedition and you, and you put stores of food out there for yourself so that you can travel lightly and get from place to place. Don't store up stuff like that for your flesh. Empty the fuel tanks. Torpedo the Navy. Make no provision. Burn the storehouses. Defund the flesh. <laughs> now look back at verse 13. Consider again those pairs of darkness deeds. And what would it look like to scuttle the ships of drunken revelry, sexual deviancy, and selfish conflict? Well, listen, if entertainment, friendships, activities create situations that for you normalize the pursuit of pleasure, partying, drunkenness, and revelry, then scuttle those ships. Don't do those activities. Put distance between those relationships. Make no provision for the flesh. This is a simple, straightforward command, and your life is at stake. If you keep a storehouse of provision for sexual temptation, whether it's devices, activities, relationships that normalize sexual expression outside of God's design, my friend, scuttle the ships. Make no provision. If your smartphone puts prostitutes in your pocket, Get rid of the smartphone. Make it a dumb phone. You don't need one. Do whatever you have to do to scuttle that ship. If social media provides a venue and a temptation for you towards strife and jealousy, arguments on Twitter, strife in the comments section of a blog post, or if scrolling Facebook brings you into contact with what other people possess and what other people get to do that provokes envy and jealousy in you, scuttle the ship. How I wouldn't love for somebody to put a torpedo in Facebook. <laughs> I know Facebook can be used for good purposes. But if for you it is a cause for strife and jealousy, my friends, it's not worth it. Don't hit the snooze button on what is killing your Christian life. It is time to wake up. Now, there's a risk in giving such specific applications to some of these Principles. You might think you're off the hook if I didn't mention the one that applies to you. Just put yourself back on the hook. Whatever it is in your heart that is a provision for deeds of darkness, for the flesh and its desires, for that which displeases God, for that which is a misappropriation of your life and your resources and your stewardship before God that matters in eternity, whatever that is, let God do work in your heart. Christian, your time on earth is almost done. It's not a time for napping. Don't hit the snooze button. Walk as children of light. Put on Christ. The night is almost gone. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. You are a mighty fortress for us in this battle. You are our refuge and our strength our enemy, his craft and power are great. He's armed with cruel hate. But we have confidence in this one little word, shall fell him.